Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The president of the University of Memphis on growth, a new board, and much more tonight on Behind the Headlines. <laughs> I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by David Rudd, president, University of Memphis. Thanks for being here again. Good to be here. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. You have a lot going on. There's always a lot going on at the Uni University of Memphis. You, you were on here, we were talking before the show, I think it was two, three years ago. Yeah, about two and a half years ago. You'd yeah. recently uh, taken the job. Um, now you have a new board. And we will start there because some people will hear that and if they don't follow this stuff, they'll think, well, it's just a new board, it's just some new people. Yeah. It's a it's a change that the university has been looking for for decades. Oh, I would think, yeah, I think three decades. Talk about at least. why this is so significant. Yeah, it, it's significant for for a number of reasons. And I think at the heart of it uh, is uh, we move from a from the Tennessee Board of Regents system to an independent board. And when you move to an independent board, uh, it allows you not only flexibility, freedom, the capacity to innovate and respond more quickly, but but for us, what it does is it moves us out of a system where we were one of 45 institutions uh, and, and we were accountable and reporting to a board that managed 45 institutions. I think they did a, a wonderful job of managing um, all of those institutions, but at the heart of that, um, there's not a lot of time to address university-specific issues. Uh, this board allows us to focus only on the University of Memphis and only focus on issues that are relevant to us and unique to us. And so it allows us, I think, for the first time in our history to genuinely pursue movement from Carnegie Two status to Carnegie One status. Uh, it allows us to grow. It allows us to do things we just have not been able to do. What is, what is that, Carnegie uh, One? Carnegie that? One is tier one. When you, hear, um, when you hear universities talk about tier one research status, so if you're a tier okay. one research university, you're a Carnegie One university. We're currently a Carnegie Two uh, I see, university. I see. And what, what, um, what was it? Were there prohibitions against that? Was it simply that the old board had so many schools it was trying to balance? It was. I think some people talked about there was favoritism to University of Tennessee Knoxville or other schools. I mean, what what would prevent in the old world from that kind of really significant thing um, going forward? Yeah, I don't know that it was any. I don't know that it was any political uh, issue in particular. But what it was is clustering the University of Memphis with 45 institutions, and of those 45 institutions, 30. 39 were community colleges and technical schools. Yeah. And so what that does is just by affiliation, it waters down our emphasis on becoming a national research university. I mean, it really doesn't allow adequate time to those kinds of needs and those kinds of, of, of issues for the university if you're, if you're struggling with managing 45 institutions. I mean, we really didn't get the opportunity. I know in the two years that I was a part of uh, the Tennessee Board of Regents System as president, we weren't able to move forward meaningful agenda items for the U of M because there are so many competing issues. Yeah. yeah. Bill. So how does the funding work? Is the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, are they now writing herd over the state funding that, that goes to, to the schools that now have their own independent. Well, they do, board. and they always have. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the reality is they always have, but we've always had a we've always had an intermediate step, and that's been the Tennessee Board of Regents. Mm -hmm. And so when we negotiated with, when we've lobbied uh, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, uh, when we've had to approach them for different issues that we'd like to move forward, we've always had to do that through the TBR system. And traditionally what we've had to do is we've done that through the system, and they were worried about not just us, but 44 other institutions. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we had difficulty moving items through. So it really is kind of a structural problem that we've corrected, and it allows independent focus, and it allows us to bring some incredibly talented people to the table who can move items for the university who can help us innovate, be creative, improve our national uh, visibility, and really take a significant step forward. So as this show airs, the board of the University of Memphis will have had its, its first meeting. 
And this is pretty organizational at, at this point, getting everybody around the table, letting the attorneys tell them what they can mm -hmm. and what they cannot do, and, and then them just asking questions about, about the scope of their responsibility, I that, think. That's correct. So tomorrow morning we have a, uh, tomorrow morning we have a meeting that starts uh, early in the morning, which will be an orientation for the board. Uh, and that's done in, in collaboration with, T with THEC, with Tennessee Higher Education Commission, along with an outside consulting group that offers some expertise in the development of a board and independent governance. And then in the afternoon, we host our first meeting. The majority of that is organizational. It's the election of officers for the board, the uh, identification of committees, the adoption of uh, policies and the charter uh, for the board as a whole. We do have a couple of items. We have some uh, we've got some academic programs we need to get approval of. We've got tenure promotion we have to do, and we're going to get approval for uh, moving forward on the financing structure on our uh, on our new indoor practice facility for football. So we'll break down a bunch of those. J just so people listening at home, we're, we taped this a week ago, so there's a mm -hmm. little bit of a time where people have already mm -hmm. met. Some of the people who are on the board, I mean, I, I should be more objective in how I say this, but I won't. It's a very impressive group, I mean, of, of alums, of uh, people who've been involved in the university, some maybe not as publicly at least. Talk about some of these people and how they were selected. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they were ultimately appointed by the governor. So they were appointed by the governor. I certainly offered input, and we've had other people offer input into that process, but at the end of the day, they were the governor's appointments, the governor's decision. I think he's done a masterful job. I would argue that not only has he done a remarkably good job for us, he's done that across all of the boards. So for each of these independent boards, he's done a great job. Uh, you know, we have uh, Alan Graff, uh, uh, who's the CFO and Senior Executive Vice President for FedEx. Uh, we've got uh, Marvin Ellison, who's the CEO of JCPenney, an alum of the university. Brad Martin, who's the former 13-year CEO uh, of, uh, of Saks Fifth Avenue uh, and alum of the university. Um, Cato Johnson, who's a former head of THEC, uh, who was a chair of the THEC uh, uh, entity. Uh, Carol Roberts, who comes as a senior vice president from IP. Uh, Susan Springfield, a senior uh, vice president uh, at uh, First Tennessee. Uh, Doug Edwards, who is uh, an independent CEO of an of 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 independent oil and gas uh, company. Um, it, it is a remarkably attractive group. We've got a very talented faculty. Uh, the faculty represent uh, actually uh, voted and brought in a, a trustee. It's a full trustee position. It just happens to be a faculty member, and that's Kate uh, Shafson at the uh, law school, uh, and uh, she'll do a wonderful job for us. So we've got really an impressive group. I'd argue it's one of the most impressive in the state. I'd argue it challenges University of Tennessee. Yeah. So when you think about what this can do, I mean, you talk about, you, you talked a little bit in, a moment ago, things like the practice facility, but also there's just, there's a real transformation happening in and around the campus, and That's there true. has been for a while in, in terms of, we'll talk about some of that transformation and, and some of those things that physically people see or maybe don't see if they don't go yeah. onto the campus, and how does that accelerate in this new world or what? Well, I, I think it accelerates, but 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 probably um, at, a, uh, at a more strategic level, it allows us to be thoughtful uh, in implementing change and doing that with, with individuals that can help shape the strategic vision for the university uh, and do it with incredible expertise. One of the most significant things we've done is we move forward and pass the city and the county uh, passed a new TIF district uh, for uh, the neighborhood district. I would tell you that may be one of the most significant steps in the history of the university. What it will do is continue to uh, allow tax dollars to be expended in terms of improvements on safety, beautification, walkability, livability of the university neighborhood district that allows continued growth for the university. We don't have the capacity to house the number of students we need to, uh, and as a result, we rely on that neighborhood to develop facilities to house uh, a large portion of our students, bring them closer to campus. That's a lot of the development that you've seen, and so you see peripheral development in the Highland Road District uh, to support that growth and to support people living in the campus campus area, um, that is incredibly important for the development of a university community. And so I, that's one of the things that doesn't get enough attention, but I would argue may be one of the most significant things we've done. And we should, I could try to fumble my way through, but I'm going to put Bill on the spot to describe when, when the president here says that tax dollars are going to, it's 
not property taxes. This is a TIF uh, tax increment financing. Yeah. Explain how that tax works. Tax increment financing is property tax. <laughs> exactly what I said it was. Re right. Revenue. Right. right. <laughs> this is you like were thinking of tourism you. development yeah, I, zone, I, which is yeah, sales tax. Yeah, I shouldn't tax. have said anything. This well, is property tax revenue that, that goes into an area and, and, and historically these districts have been pretty well defined uh, n not not like a really large area like let's just suck the the, the revenue in from that they're very well defined areas mm -hmm. and ver very well defined plans for what kind of growth you want to uh, see right and, and basically in the part I can't believe I did that <laughs> but in the part that is always interesting to me is we debate tax you know uh, incentives and proposals pilots TIFs TDZs this one is saying here's the defined area if we're going to invest money in streetscape and improvements to roads improvements then the that will spur more development which will increase not people paying more taxes but tax values and property values exactly. and investment right so it's it done ideally it's a virtuous circle right oh, absolutely it's and i would it, i would argue it's an incredibly effective economic stimulus effort and and so what you've seen there is is very significant growth you saw the the development of the highland row project which is now being completed and i will tell you that the char restaurant over there is doing very well uh, and those those different retail outlets are doing very well and you're going to see some new development I think that uh uh, one of the newspapers shared a little bit about the the planned development of some uh, townhomes uh, in that neighborhood on the backside. You saw development building of a couple of new homes in that neighborhood for the first time probably in a couple of decades, uh, which was great to see, and I know that they've sold. You've seen a lot of development in there. You're going to see a lot more development and investment in that area. That's critical for a residential university experience. Well, and one key part of that, and I'll go back to Bill, one key part of that, though, and we talked a little before the show, and we've had some of the people involved with the TIF and so on, on on here um, is walkability That's is exactly making that area walkable That's because you you've got students you've got you got to have better crossings you've got to have better sidewalks you've got, all those things are really important in terms of attracting people right exactly. I mean it sounds like a common sense mm -hmm. thing but you all have been I mean in, in the past the U of M was a bit of an island mm -hmm. with some pretty busy streets yeah. that kept people from getting in and out in an easy way is that, that fair that's to say? exactly the issue and if you go over there now I think what you'll see uh, in Loretta and I go and eat on the Highland Row at least once a week and and we want to spend our money there as well um, and what you'll see if you go through there at lunch is you'll see people walking from the neighborhood from the university over to the Highland Row to eat and they don't drive um, and that the overall walkability the population density there has improved profoundly uh, in the overall experience, the residential feel and experience of that area has improved profoundly. That's critical for a university. So, so how do you keep all of this new development uh, mixed use with, with, with housing and retail? What, what's the secret to keeping that affordable for college students as well as drawing in other people? To it. You know, I, th I think that uh, I, I think that Memphis actually has done a, a great job of that uh, in a lot of areas in the city. I mean, I you know I live Loretta and I live in Midtown, which is a great example of uh, of a lot of different levels of housing and retail integrated in a wonderful fashion that improves the overall uh, livability. Uh, of the area, and I think the university uh, is doing a nice job. You'll see some of those those Highland Row apartments probably are a little more expensive than most of our students are going to afford, but with thoughtful planning, there are other developments. There's a new development that's coming on, uh, the Nine, that will be um, opening uh, this fall uh, that is predominantly going to be students, and if you go into the Highland Row area in the evening, so if you go eat one at one of those uh, uh, restaurants, what you'll see is a mix of students and other individuals from the community that we've got a, a broad array of individuals from young to, to middle age and beyond that are making use of that. It really is developing very nicely, and I think that they've been thoughtful about the development um, in, in, in particularly making sure that it's affordable. So is the university involved in a housing opportunity like that? Are, are, are you part of the arrangement, the financing of it? We're or? not a part of the financing of it. What we have been a part of is discussing uh, how to make it uh, competitive and how to how to integrate. We, we've started the process of reaching out to create partnering uh, with those facilities for academic programming. So if you look at for us, uh, it's a simple reality. The closer you live to the University of Memphis, the more likely you are to do well in class, the more likely you are to be retained, and the more likely you are to graduate. Uh, 
And so the closer we can get you to campus, and, and if you're on campus, those numbers go up as well. So for us to do academic programming and partnering with those facilities is critical. And we've started those conversations and started those efforts to integrate those facilities into our academic programming and support and, and really respond to those students like they're living on our campus. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we get better retention, better graduation, better performance, and a better experience for everybody involved. In, in the governor's budget, did I see money for the music building? You did. Uh, there's about $30 million uh, in there for the music facility. Uh, that effort's been underway for uh, a decade or more. Uh, we have already raised our match for that facility, so when the budget is complete and approved at the end of this year, we'll start formal planning for that project and should be breaking ground uh, for that project a year from uh, late this spring. Where, where will that be? Well, that's still being debated a little bit. The original site, though, is most likely going to be next to the Holiday Inn. Okay. So that parking lot next to the Holiday mm -hmm. Inn. And that's a facility, a performance facility, that have integrated classroom uh, space in it and performance and practice space for the School of Music, uh, but also facilitate our partnership with the symphony uh, that we have. And so the symphony will be utilizing that facility as well. We're incredibly grateful for the governor supporting that effort. How important has it been to connect both sides of the railroad track? It seems like such a such a simple thing, this but is down southern. Th this is down southern. Right, right. Yeah. It, it is not a simple thing, mm -hmm. uh, it, but it is transformational. Uh, and uh, it is um, arguably the most transformational step in terms of anything the university has built. Uh, to this point. So we, we improved the crossings. We did that with uh, a grant. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to match a couple of hundred thousand dollars out of 1.8 million to, to get that done. So it was incredibly uh, a great uh, deal for us as a university. And we've created three central crossing points. It dramatically improved the look of that area. And now we're going to build the bridge over that. And on one side of the bridge will be an amphitheater. Uh, on the other side of the bridge, there'll be a student plaza, and then they'll connect into the uh, new parking garage that will be on the other side. And then in about 18 months, we'll break ground on the new student recreation center that we have modified the plans to, to meet more uh, appropriately the financial model for the university as a whole. So you'll see continuous building for the next five to six years at the university. And, and, and the crossing is more than just a way over the railroad tracks. This, this better defines what's on both sides this track. connects this mm -hmm. connects what had been a fragmented campus to some degree. So what this really does is it improves the overall residential feel um, of the campus and really does connect both portions of campus, make them accessible in an easy and meaningful way. And that really is critical for what we have tried to do is develop a residential community that involves not just the University of Memphis, but the University Neighborhood District. And our partnership with that uh, neighborhood district group has been one that has moved along very very nicely. They've been incredibly supportive and they've got some, I think, some fascinating things ahead, particularly with TIF money. Um, and we are making an effort now. We've got an art task force. We've got an effort to improve community art in that area. And you'll be seeing more about that in the coming years. Yeah, we, that is the show we did. I think we had TK Buchanan on. We had some other great, folks on um, six months, a year ago. Um, I have no sense of time anymore. But, but the one thing I will say, the um, uh, this goal of residential. So, you know, I moved to Memphis 20 something years ago ago, mm -hmm. at <clears throat> University of Memphis, I think it was Memphis State, might have been then, mm -hmm. was known as a commuter college. Mm -hmm. Commuter college. You talked about that when you were on the show a couple years yeah, ago. Absolutely. What are your goals? I mean, do you have a number, a percentage of students? Sure, what, sure. What, where, what is that goal for you, and, and when do you think you can get there in terms of having more students and, and being more of a residential? Yeah. Well, it depends on how you define there. Sure. And so, so I, you know, I think that for us, the reality is we're, we're at about 2,400 students residential that live in our facility. So out if you look of how many out of 22,000. Out of 22. Out of 22,000. And okay. so, but if you look at how we've redefined this, if you look at the neighborhood district, we've got another 3,000 in the neighborhood district now. And okay. so we have more than doubled students that I would tell you are arguably residential for the University sure. of Memphis. And, and, and if you look at their performance as students, 
uh, comparable to our residential students, their improvement is better than students that live five, 10 miles from the campus right. because they end up spending more time on campus. Yeah. And we'll, we, will ex we will expand that effort by private partnerships. One of the things the board is gonna provide for us is the opportunity uh, to do private partnering. And what that means is for us not to build a facility, but for us to be a partner in a facility. Yeah. I'm exploring as we speak an effort to build a new dorm facility on the Park Avenue campus. We would not build it. It would be built by a private partner. Yeah, and, and this is a trend nationally. Am I it right? We're, and I, actually, it's been a trend nationally for more than a decade. We're behind the curve. Behind the curve. Yeah. EDR yeah. is a local company people yeah. talk to. That uh, EDR okay. is a national leader that has done this. Absolutely. It, it, yeah. What else is going on on the South Campus? Um, we've got the basketball facility that will be complete in late September. Um, we've got, I'll bring to the board a meeting tomorrow, uh, the uh, financing, uh, uh, get approval to pursue finalizing the financing for the indoor practice facility. Uh, we're pursuing um, redoing, we're pursuing uh, doing a private partnership on the dorm there. We've got some new gating that will go up uh, over yeah. there in the next six months. Uh, so that there'll be some new gating and signage uh, over on the Park Avenue campus. We We've improved our dorm facility that we have there. We have uh, graduate and married student housing there. We've done some improvements over the course of the last yeah. year. Uh, so we've actually got a lot of activity on both sides. But we, there, a question about, we talk about national trends. Um, I think we talked about when you were on, mm -hmm. around, maybe, maybe Brad Martin in, as the interim or you as in your first year changed the definition of in-state, out-of-state tuition. That's correct. And, and broadened it to a, what, 250? 250, 250 mile radius. In, including into Arkansas, mm -hmm. and into, which again gets to this whole thing if, if it, the, the Board of Regents maybe didn't understand, they, people lose track of the fact Memphis is a region, it's hooked to all these different mm -hmm. um, areas. How has that played out in terms of bringing in students? Well, it's been great. I mean, actually, uh, so if you go back and look, and I'll share with you a couple things I think are really important to keep in mind. If you go back and look historically at the university, I could give you a graph that shows the last 15 years of tuition at the University of Memphis. Um, prior to 2014, the average tuition increase at the University of Memphis was 8% over 15 years. That's a lot. Uh, and that's not sustainable. Year over year. Year over year. Uh, and the problem with that is that it, it, it drove the price point for the university as a whole beyond a reasonable price point for, for our regional competitors. Yeah. And so if you looked at out-of-state tuition, you're going from $9,000 for in-state tuition to $21,000 for out-of-state tuition at the University of Memphis. And if you go to Arkansas and ask a student across the bridge to come to the university and pay two and a half times what they would pay at the University of Arkansas, they're going to argue with you about that and tell that's probably not a financially reasonable thing to do. So the 250 mile radius program was critical. Um, I would tell you that we, with a new board, we have the capacity to look at tuition much more strategically. It is now antiquated to think about tuition as an in-state, out-of-state uh, variable, particularly given the growth of online programs. About 10% of our students are online and we've launched a new effort to, we've launched a new division called U of M Global. That is entirely for fully right. online students. And the growth of that has been, has been significantly more than we anticipated over the last three months. And so the idea of, of, of a flat tuition rate is, is regardless of in-state or out-of-state is critical. Vanderbilt has one tuition rate, everybody pays it. Belmont has one tuition right. rate, everybody pays it. I would argue Memphis ought to have one tuition rate and everybody pay it. Well, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, nationally there, there is this this concern. I mean, you know, when, when, and I'm not picking on any school I say right now, but when, you know, Georgia, and I talk to people, who, friends of mine whose kids are much, much younger than mine, and I'll say, well, you know, Georgia is basically 45000 in in per year in mm -hmm. state room and board, and they'll kind of stare at me. And they'll say, and you say, well, you know, college tuition generally goes up about 4% a year. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe three, right. maybe five, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at big state schools that traditionally were places people would go and it could be affordable, right. costing you know, a four-year degree from Georgia could cost a quarter million dollars in, in not that long a time. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that an opportunity for the University of Memphis? It's an enormous opportunity. Yeah. It's an enormous opportunity. Let me share with you, the U.S. News and World Report rankings uh, came out uh, just a couple of days ago. The University of Memphis, they, the graduate program rankings. Yeah. We have 18 graduate programs actively ranked at the University of Memphis. Do you know that we have more graduate programs ranked than um, than Ole Miss. Yeah. Hmm. We have more graduate programs ranked than Mississippi State, more graduate programs ranked than SMU, more graduate programs uh, ranked than uh, Texas Tech, 
than Oklahoma State. And, and, and I would tell you that I don't think people realize that the value and what that speaks to is a question of value. And so is that an opportunity, remarkable opportunity, the value, the educational value at the University of Memphis is under recognized. And I would argue at a national level underappreciated, but I think we're, get, we're, we're doing a better job of sharing that narrative. We're going to continue to grow that narrative that if we had a flattened uh, tuition rate that more, that, that more seamlessly made that available for somebody in Virginia, somebody in Wisconsin, uh, why would you want to go and yeah. spend $45,000 versus be able to come to the University of Memphis and you might be able to get your entire degree for that cost for yeah. one year? Yeah. yeah. Just a minute and a half left. So, so what's the path to getting that single tuition rate? Because uh, you make more money as more students come mm -hmm. in fr from those areas, but I would imagine it's kind of something that happens over several it, it years. It happens over time, and, mm -hmm. I, and it happens over time, and, and Bill, I, I would tell you that, that a part of it is to recognize that if it's an out-of-state student, we've got a small differential. We'd probably always argue for some limited differential uh, given state support and given mm -hmm. infrastructure support for out-of-state students relative to in-state students. There's a little bit of an argument there, uh, but it's something that would happen probably over a, over a period of time of five to 10 years to realistically get there. Uh, but each step of the way, like the 250 mile radius program, makes us profoundly more competitive, makes us profoundly more attractive, and it helps us grow. We grew, our freshman class year over year from two years ago to this last year grew 30% was the largest freshman class that we had. As a university, we grew for the first time in eight years. We grew 4% last year. We think we'll grow again this year. And a part of that is a combination of not just visibility, development around the university, movement of what we've done and sharing the narrative uh, academically, but also the affordability of the university. I, 20 seconds, can you talk about the new Veterans Care Center? You've done a absolutely. bunch of stuff with veterans. I, I meant to spend more time on this. I, I appreciate just that. Brief. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a, an anonymous gift that allows us to uh, uh, to add a Veterans Care Center to us, our, our Psychological Services Center. And it's not to treat just student veterans. It's to offer veterans services to veterans in our community and, and specifically targeting mental health care, psychological services that are innovative, proven, empirically supported. Okay. Well, thank you. I should have given that more time, but thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.